Hey, Jeff, do you celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Have you ever celebrated it? How do you celebrate it if you do? Yeah, I I guess I kind of do. I Here's the caveat, is that I think on the West Coast, where I'm from, originally from California, and now I'm here in Portland, I would never say that St. Patrick's Day was a really big holiday. There's, of course, like festivals. There's like people going out and drinking, you know, the Whatever your nearest Irish bar is always going to be pretty crowded during St. Patrick's Day. But in comparison to some places that I've heard about, such as uh, I believe it's Chicago that dyes their river green for the mm-hmm. for the event. There's just there's never been something that that sort of festivaly that that sort of grandiose in terms of St. Patrick's Day. I would say for me, because it's happening sort of really close to where, where my birthday is, mm. that usually sort of molds into one one sort of uh, holiday and people usually just dress green for my birthday and I'll, you know, maybe we'll drink some Guinness or something like that. Sort of molds into two holidays for me. <laughs> it's interesting. I think that the holiday is celebrated in lots of different ways now by lots of different people. I'm from the Northeast of the United States where St. Patrick's Day was kind of a big deal, I think. I'm, I'm assuming in Boston, it's got to be a huge deal, it's right? big in Boston, it's big in New York, and in places in between. And I was a place in between. And it was interesting doing research because, of course, today is um, geography is St. Patrick's Day. And in, learning about how much of St. Patrick's Day, the way it's celebrated now, actually does come from things that were happening in the United States. Uh, but, of course, to go way back, which we will in a moment – We'll have to discover sort of the origins of who this person was, and 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 we'll sort of track the way the holiday has changed over time as well. Um, on the one hand, it's a religious celebration. In in other ways, it's a celebration of Irishness, and then for some people, it's a reason to party. Uh, it's you know, it's the spring is almost here kind of thing, and All people right. are looking for a, a reason to go out. Sometimes, I would say that latter definition. Is probably where I fall on the spectrum. Okay, <laughs> it's more of a party holiday, more of a going out, you know, celebrating at your your nearest bar kind of holiday. Maybe you get a maybe you get a green beer, or you just have a Guinness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a it's there are very few national holidays. I mean, it's not a necessarily national holiday like Independence Day or something like that. But there are a few holidays that celebrate particular ethnicities that are as embraced by people that are not of that ethnicity as St. Patrick's Day. I think. Absolutely. I would, I would, I would say that's probably true. Right. Don't you think, I mean, that's, it's different in different places, but I think that holds up in a lot of different places. Now with all holidays and most of the topics that we talk about here, it's, it's not only that people celebrate in different ways, but the historical record um, record doesn't really capture everything correctly, right? Cause this is, we have to go way back to find out who St. Patrick was and the historical record is not able to definitively account for many details. Even some really basic details are pretty fuzzy. So we'll, that, that's going to pop up where I'll say, maybe this is the way it happened because n- nobody really knows in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do want to call out one source that I used uh, that was particularly helpful and I think the most comprehensive study of St. Patrick's Day that I encountered. It's called The Wearing of Green, A History of St. Patrick's Day by Mike Cronin and Daryl Adair. Check it out if you want to get even deeper into the stuff that we're going to be talking about. So St. Patrick's Day, or the Feast of St. Patrick, is celebrated annually on March 17th, which if you're listening to this on the first day this drops, that's coming up pretty soon. However, if it falls during Holy Week, the Catholic Church reschedules St. Patrick's Day. Did you know about this? I, I had no idea that there was any sort of rescheduling. Well, it, it it's interesting because, you know, St. Patrick's Day, is it's a holiday of sorts. It's not like a federal holiday. Nobody really gets the day off necessarily. But here in the United States, you know, I don't know how much, I guess, power the Catholic Church would have to change the date on, let's yeah, say, that, everybody's Google calendars, right? Right. I think people are celebrating on the 17th regardless. Right. Um, but in, in, in the religious aspect of things... A holy week is the week before Easter, and it's the sort of most important and sacred and solemn week in the Christian religion. And so, for example, in 1940, I believe St. Patrick's Day fell on Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Easter. And so they rescheduled it for April 3rd, which seems like kind of far from the 17th. Um, Again, I'm not sure what the, the popular expression of that was. And then 
in t- 2008, they rescheduled it for March 15th. They moved it up. Again, I 2008 wasn't that long ago. I'm pretty sure I celebrated it on the 17th. Uh, but the next time that St. Patrick's Day falls during Holy Week will be in 2160. So I don't know oh, wow. if plans have been made for what to do about this yet, but it seems like we can sit on that for a while. It's probably okay. Yeah, let's let's get to 2050 and figure, right. figure out what the next if, yeah. or sorry 2060 and then figure out what the next hundred years going to be. 2025, like. even at this point, I feel like yeah. <laughs> so March 17th is the day that's recognized as the anniversary of St. Patrick's death. Of course, nobody really knows. He lived approximately 385 to 461 Common Era. Pretty much every source I looked at had different dates, but they're all around those dates. So nobody really knows for sure. Nobody knows where he's actually buried. There's different claims. Uh, But we can say that he lived during the era of the Roman Empire, which is important to our story. And uh, St. Patrick's Day also occurs now during the Christian celebration of Lent, which I sort of alluded to earlier, which begins on Ash Wednesday, Lent does. And it ends on the Thursday or Saturday before Easter, depending on the denomination celebrating it. Lent commemorates the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the desert. And then usually involves individuals taking sacrifices or abstinences of various luxuries. And so St. Patrick's Day usually is a day to break away from those self-denials of Lent and let loose a little bit and then get back into Lent, waiting for it to end and for Easter to come. So who was St. Patrick? Jeff, what do you know about St. Patrick? Not 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 a lot. And I'm gonna guess that based on how old, you know, he is, that we probably don't actually know all that much about him, like in sort of you know, truthfulness. However, I do know, like, I think I've heard some, like, you know, pretty dark or grim stories about Mm. sort of, like, where he originates from. And I think it's about, like, driving a certain, like, type of person or maybe a certain type of religious person out of Ireland. Is that, am I, am I getting anywhere close? I don't want to besmirch anybody's name here. (laughs) No, no, this is an interpretation. I mean, this is somebody who's often credited with bringing Christianity to Ireland. Um, gotcha. So the, the specific instant you're raising, we will definitely address a little bit later once we find out who this guy is. Okay. Uh, that's that's part of the legend. And, you know, legends are, have some truth to them and sometimes they don't. And so we'll explore the aspects of this that are probably not true and some things that might be true. Great. So Pat, Patrick was born in Romano, British lands. He was not Irish, first of all. So that's the first thing. St. Patrick, not mm-hmm. Irish. And nor was Ireland conquered by the Romans. But he he probably was born in Wales, maybe Scotland, possibly England. So someplace close to Ireland, but not Ireland. Romano-British refers to the culture area that arose after the Roman conquest of what is today England, Wales, and part of Scotland. It was a mix of Roman culture and the culture of the Britons who were a Celtic people. So that's that's his background. And he wasn't born Patrick. He was born... Maywin Sukat. That was that. That's what people think his name was. That sounds very Gaelic. Uh, it is. I Gaelic. don't know. I'm, I don't speak Gaelic, but it sounds like a very Gaelic name. To me. I think or Maywin Welsh I, name. is Welsh. I think, which is a Gaelic mm-hmm. language. So he later was ordained in the Christian Church and took up the name Patrius. Patricius. I'm not sure. You can pronounce that in many different ways, which eventually became Patrick. Right. Um, I mean, and that's very Roman, <laughs> Patricius or whatever. It right. Is. Yeah. That's, that's clearly Roman, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Understanding of St. Patrick lies predominantly in a text called the Declaration, which traditionally is understood to be written by Patrick himself, although maybe that's not true. And maybe everything that he wrote about isn't exactly the case, but that's where a lot of the information from his life comes from. So the Declaration recounts that around the, around the age of 16, Let's call him Patrick, even though he wasn't Patrick at this time. Around the age of 16, Patrick was captured by Irish marauders, by pirates. He was enslaved and brought to what is what was then Gaelic Ireland, what Ireland was referred to up until and leading to the 17th century. He was held in Ireland for six years and was a shepherd. Uh, And during this time, he developed a strong Christian faith. His father was a deacon, which is uh, sort of a lower ranking officer of, of, of the church. And the declaration recounts that an angel appeared to Patrick in a dream and told him that he should escape Ireland and return back home. This is kind of fascinating. I mean, again, I think there's always historical, you know, inaccuracies or, you know, what ifs or who's, who's that kind of stuff that goes with history. But it's kind of interesting 
you know, talking about somebody who's so intrinsically tied to the, well, really the entire I- island of Ireland, who kind of has a negative history with it, at least starting history, right? It's, you know, it seems like it started with, you know, him being, you know, you know, dragged from his home, wherever that was to the island and then trying to escape from it later. Yeah, that's how this all gets set up. So it is interesting. None of this part of the story I really heard before when I was growing up. And, you know, we would talk about St. Patrick's Day in school and what it's all about. This this part was left out of the story each time, I feel like. Yeah, uh, I've never heard any of this. <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is news maybe to a lot of people. So his journey led him back to what is now Britain, probably England, and sub and subsequently to what is now France, where he studied at a, a monastery. And at some point, he was again visited by an angel, according to the Declaration, uh, who said that now you have to, you should return to Ireland and 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 convert people to Christianity. So this was the vision from an angel from God. These were his instructions. So he was probably not the first priest to go to Ireland to see converts. There are accounts of the bishop Bishop Palladius was sent to Ireland by the Pope to con, to convert Celtic people Celtic people before Patrick returned there himself. But Patrick is often remembered and, and lauded as the individual who brought Christianity to Ireland. So there were legends that he was capable of performing miracles. And by the 8th century, he was widely regarded as the saint of Ireland and the Irish people. And some speculate that the legend of St. Patrick mixes with the story of this individual, Palladius. And maybe that that's a composite image that we're getting of a number of different people who are bringing Christianity to to what was then what sometimes people would call a pagan religion, right? The, the Celtic religion. Right. Ireland at that point was probably polythe- polytheistic, probably, you know, I, we, we've talked a lot about sort of pagan rituals and sort of, especially on our other holiday episodes, such as, you know, our Christmas episode, yep. how they get sort of assumed into to Christianity in a lot of different ways. It seems like that that St. Patrick, you know, was able to convert. Well, I don't know if he was able to convert. I don't know. I'm going to backtrack that that thought for a second. But it just seems wild that he was able to have leave such a an impact on the island without. I don't know where where others failed. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate your points that you're making, especially about you know, did he really convert everybody to Christianity? Because right. clearly that's not the case. I mean, if you go back to our Halloween episode, we learned a lot about how. Um, <laughs> you know, pagan traditions and religion endured in Ireland long after St. Patrick had right. gone. So, but this is, this is part of what he's credited for. He, he, another interesting fact about St. Patrick you might not know is that he was never formally canonized by the Catholic church. So technically he's not a saint, although the Catholic church seems to effectively refer to Patrick as a saint. And it's not just the Catholic church that observes his his role it's it's christian christianity more broadly mm-hmm. so we refer to him as a saint but i think back then the process for becoming a saint wasn't set up yet or something like that and so that's gotcha. some of that so the story of saint patrick is riddled with legends many of these are not true jeff you sort of mentioned one when we first started talking about this right I'm probably <laughs> I don't really remember. you were talking about <laughs> driving people out of the island right Oh, right. Yes. Yes. Well, whether that's legend or truth, I have no idea. It could be. Well, I kind of hope it's just a legend. (laughs) It's more of an allegory. In fact, there's a legend that Patrick, I don't know if you've heard this one, drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Yeah, I guess that's so I so I've heard that. I think I've heard that exact same phrasing that he drove all the snakes, which and I think in maybe other readings or maybe, you know, somebody had mentioned this before that the snakes were actually a certain type of people. Yeah, so the it's an allegory. I think some people maybe wanted to interpret this literally, but there there have never been snakes in Ireland. And there might be some in a zoo or <laughs> some that have escaped or something, but they're not indigenous to There's not this Yeah. The the conditions not, aren't not, great for reptiles there, I feel like. Totally. Not a yeah. whole lot of sun on Ireland and yeah. <laughs> reptiles need sun. <laughs> so the the allegory is that the, the snakes, and this is, of course, a very pejorative way usually to talk about people, were non-Christians that were referred to as pagans or, or heathens. And thus, the idea is Patrick was thought to have driven pagan religion from Ireland, 
which as you mentioned is a giant overstatement because that's not really what happened. It, people started adopting Christianity, but it wasn't that he went around and everybody converted at the time that he was right. there. Uh, another legend <clears throat> of Patrick involves shamrocks. Jeff, do you know what a shamrock is? Is that a four-leaf clover? It's a three-leaf or something clover. like that. It's a three-leaf clover. Yeah. Okay. The four-leaf four clover, clover is special. Is, yeah. Okay. Special. Okay. But it, okay. So it's a three-leaf clover, and for some reason we call it a shamrock, and I have no idea why we do that. Well, the, the shamrock is the English name that was derived from the Irish word for young clover. Uh, oh, okay. The shamrock has been a symbol of Ireland since at least the 1700s, but has also figured in literature and accounts before that. And then there are depictions of St. Patrick holding a shamrock, apparently that date back to 1675. And a central belief in Christianity is the Holy Trinity. And what the Holy Trinity is, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are understand to be one God, not three different gods. And so the legend goes that St. Patrick used shamrocks, which have three leaves, to explain this concept of the Holy Trinity to potential converts. Scholars don't actually believe this happened. This probably didn't, this probably did not go on. The notion that the shamrock was sacred to pre-Christian Celtic people is out there as well, though that's debated. There doesn't seem to be any direct evidence to support this. So it is funny in, in, in thinking about like the history and how history sort of evolves, because something like this seems like, yeah, maybe like it seems like that a very logical way that St. Patrick might have explained the Holy Trinity, whatever. There's probably no evidence of it, but maybe like somebody 200 years ago was like, oh, this this seems to make sense to me. I'm going to write it down. Yeah. And then now that becomes sort of the popular history when, when like there's no actual like evidence ever going back to the 800s or wherever, 400s, whenever St. Patrick was actually around. That yeah, he there's did no that. evidence for this, I think. And it was already 450 years ago that somebody's like, well, this is this is, must be what happened, right? Because there's shamrocks all over the place and we think of shamrocks right. and- so let's talk about the holiday itself and how it developed, but let's take a short break before we do that. Okay, we will do our very first ad break and we will be right back. And we're back. It's the Geography is Everything podcast. We're talking about Geography's St. Patrick's Day. We talked a little bit about who St. Patrick was or who we thought he was. And now we're going to talk about the rise of the holiday itself. So scholars of St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day suggest that Irish people have celebrated the feast of St. Patrick's Day since the 9th or 10th centuries. So this is a holiday that's been around for a long time. However, the holiday was different back then, and it was more of a religious celebration, a bit more of a solemn affair than what we think about today when we think about celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Important for context here is that the English military and political presence in Ireland really dates back to 1169 with the Norman conquest of part of what is now Ireland and Northern Ireland. And so that began over 800 years of English intervention and control in Ireland the English crown increased this control in the 15th and 16th centuries, and the Republic of Ireland didn't become independent until 1921, which is pretty recently on the scale of things that we're talking about here. That is very recent. In fact, I think, I think I've heard it before said that Ireland is actually considered to be England's first colony or, or Britain's first colony because they, they, were, they were subjugated basically back in the medieval times, long before there was any sort of, you know, quote unquote, discovery period of time. <laughs> That's certainly the opinion of some of the scholars I was reading and also probably the perspective of some, but certainly not all Irish people as well, is that this, is a, this was a colonial legacy. March 17th became known as St. Patrick's Day. That is the anniversary of, of his death we mentioned but it was first officially observed by the Catholic Church, in other words, by the Pope in Rome, probably in the early 1600s. So it was celebrated, but became more of a prominent thing for the Catholics. And part of that was emphasizing their control, I think, over this domain as well. There's an individual named Luke Wadding, who is a historian and Franciscan theologian, uh, who was the individual probably that was behind establishing the Feast of St. Patrick as a holy day of obligation in Ireland. Wadding was born in Waterford, Ireland in 1588. 
So this was still a religious celebration, but as we get into the 17th century, we see some documentation where it becomes increasingly observed in a more secular and popular way, which includes eating and drinking and dancing and general merriment, and also the wearing of shamrocks as well. So, you know, I, I, I have to imagine, you know, we, we already sort of talked about Lent. We talked about, and, and, and we talked a little bit during our Christmas episode about Easter and how Easter is such a, I guess, very important, a very kind of solemn religious holiday for, it's the for big Catholics. And it's a big one. Christmas, I think, was also had some solemnness to it. It's interesting thinking like how, you know, St. Patrick's Day in particular evolved from being maybe a more solemn holiday to sort of a festival of merriment and drinking and everything. And I, I, I like to think that it's just because people were just tired of being sad all the time. <laughs> like it, who wants another ho- holiday where we're, <laughs> I mean, I think it does speak a little bit to that dynamic that people need to celebrate and people over time have wanted to celebrate, but there's certain reasons why this was celebrated. And so it's, it's part of it is a wanting to celebrate. Part of it is wanting to celebrate certain aspects of really being Irish at one point. We're, we're going to get to that. It, it's, it's religious, but it's also a very, kind of nationalistic kind of holiday as well. Um, I would say there, there are probably no, there's probably no other single holiday that I, that I personally attribute to a single country more so than St. Patrick's day. Right. That's, and that's pretty well known. Of course, we live in a country with many people of Irish heritage, many Irish immigrants. And so that, that adds up. Here's the, here's a silly question, Jeff, but I'm going to ask it anywhere because it sets up what I want to say next. What color do you associate with St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> green. It's got to be green. <laughs> Did you know that originally St. Patrick was depicted as wearing blue and blue is associated with the Feast of St. Patrick? There's even a color called St. Patrick blue. It's hard to know. I had no idea. That yeah. seems so off and so wrong. I... I, I don't even want to see that image. Because <laughs> it's certainly not conflated with Irishness or Irish nationalism no. today. And we'll get well, to why like, that is. Like I- Ireland's nickname is what? It's like the, the Emerald Isle or right. something like that. Yep. And, and you know, it, and I think anybody who's been to Ireland could probably attest to the fact that it's a very green place. They get a lot of rain. It's very like a lot of pastures that are full of green, a lot of g- large green leafy green place trees all that kind of stuff ivy all that kind of stuff it seems wild that any other sort of color would be sort of associated with a holiday that's also so closely associated with ireland (laughs) i was also surprised to learn this apparently saint patrick blue is kind of an azure hue um but let's let's talk about how green becomes increasingly associated with Ireland. So apparently green has been associated with Ireland, probably for a lot of the reasons you're talking about, to the landscape itself, since the 11th century. But it was really later that green becomes strongly conflated with Ireland and the Irish in support for an independent Ireland. So if we go back in time to 1641, there was an Irish Catholic uprising against English rule. And at that time, the this these groups adopted a flag with a gold harp emblazoned on a green background. So, so we start to see the emergence of the green symbology in that flag. And then an even bigger uprising was in 1798. This is the revolt of the United Irish Movement against British rule. Uh, British and loyalist forces, so forces loyal to Britain, brutally crushed the rebellion, leaving thousands, if not tens of thousands, dead. And during and after this, Green became very closely tied to Ireland and to St. Patrick's Day. A ballad from this era, The Wearing of Green, which was the name of the book that I mentioned earlier as well, is a lament of the suppression of the rebellion and the killing of those wearing green. So at this point, Green really starts to become symbolic, not only of the Irish, but of an Irish desire to become independent as well. Right. And I can, again, I can see that you can sort of see the prominence of green within the the island itself and why it might be so important. I also think green is a very different color from sort of the historic colors of of England and then later, you know, the United Kingdom, which is England is red and white and United Kingdom is red, white and blue. So having something that's, I, I would say, significantly different. And I believe Ireland's other main color today is orange. Am I, am I correct in that? It is. And orange is more conflated with the Protestant Irish. Okay. Or, or well, anyways, I guess yeah. the point the point being, I can see, you know, choosing these colors 
just to, to be able to mark yourself as significantly different from basically your oppressor, right? Right. And I mean, this is an illustration of how important symbology really is. It really means an awful lot. And, you know, wearing green was code for fighting for independence and being, you know, beat down and you move forward. So, so green is, is important for, for some of these reasons. Um, it's important to note, though, that Patrick is not just celebrated by the Irish Catholic community, that the Protestant communities have and, and many continue to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. But we'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is, as you mentioned, pretty widely celebrated around the world. I, mean, there's, there's, I think there's celebrations in most countries of various sizes, and a lot of that has to do with the Irish diaspora, the, the, the incredible migration, out-migration from Ireland to other parts of the world. I mean, this happened, you know, in the 1700s, 16, 1700s, and a lot of people who were poor and disenfranchised tried to take the opportunity to go someplace else, including England. Liverpool is a major destination. Um, North America, Australia, a few other places became very big destinations for uh, Irish people setting out to to find new fortune in someplace else. But this immigration reached like a really fever pitch in the mid 1800s during the Irish potato famine, which we have two episodes. We have two episodes about the potato, and we talk a bit about that in there. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be worth someday, like revisiting and telling the actual full story of the Irish potato famine, because I think what you're alluding to here, Hunter, is that 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 particular out migration has impacted a large part of the world, right? In exactly. fact, it's funny because you were talking about how St. Patrick's Day is celebrated sort of, you know, basically every country in the world, probably at least a little bit, right? And I would be willing to bet that that probably matches up pretty closely with cities and countries that have Irish pubs, in them. And if you ever go traveling abroad, you can almost find an Irish pub in every major city in the world. <laughs> That's true. I think that they, some of them were set up independently, but I think that there was also this movement of sort of a, a corporate chain almost, so to speak, of, of pubs being set Probably. up all over the place. But I agree that looking specifically at the potato famine might be a really interesting single episode for us to explore. Mm -hmm. So because we have the episode, I want, and because apparently we're going to do another one, I want to say too much about it. But let me say that the potato was introduced in Ireland, and it's originally from probably Peru, the Andes. It was introduced in the 1600s and became a staple food very quickly, particularly for the poor, because it grows really well in marginal soils and this kind of thing. It's very productive. So the same amount of acreage that you would have for, you could produce more potatoes than you could for wheat, for example. And in the 60 years before the famine, Ireland's population doubled from 4 million to 8 million people. So it's a dramatic growth during this time. The Irish potato famine began in 1845 and endured through at least four, five, six years. It continued there that the famine itself, and this is a potato blight that affected other parts of Europe, but it was in Ireland that it, uh, because of social dynamics and poverty and things that it, it resulted in a massive famine. During the famine, it's estimated that nearly 1 million Irish people died. And so that's one in eight people. And then hundreds of thousands of people were evicted from their homes, went to cities, and then many then went to immigrate to different areas. Um, and one of the major destinations was North America. Apparently, uh, between 40, 1845 and 1851, 1 1.2 million people left Ireland, mostly to North America. So the population goes from 8 million to 6 million in six or seven years, apparently. That's an incredible transformation. Ireland has fewer people today in it than it did in 1845. I mean, and that, that's I've heard that before. That's a wild st uh, yeah. statistic, population statistic. I think it's kind of interesting because if you know, you know, I, as a geographer as, and, a, and a former city planner, I sort of keep track of sort of you know, things like housing prices and sort of housing availability around the world, because I think it's a fascinating subject. And generally, it seems like every place right now has some sort of housing emergency. And it's interesting because Ireland is has become very, very expensive in terms of being able to buy or rent uh, a house basically anywhere, but, you know, especially in you know, the major cities of you know Cork or Dublin. And 
it's it's just interesting thinking about well they have at one point they had three million more people and i'm not saying that everybody was housed the best way possible back back then i think there was definitely issues but it's interesting thinking like well how is how is there not how has there not been more houses built to accommodate just the five million that are there today right <laughs> yeah as you said i think this is a global story that there aren't enough homes for people. We have a particular problem with this in the United States, but it's, yeah, it's fascinating to think that there today in the Republic of Ireland, there are about 5 million people and in Northern Ireland, about 1.9 million people. So combined, that's about 7 million people, which is less than the eight or 8.5 million people there were in 1845. Uh, Absolutely wild. Today in the United States, over 31 million people claim some Irish ancestry. I do wonder how accurate that is. I feel like it might I feel like people in, yeah. in the United States like to stretch their ancestry type of lineage, you know, knowledge a little bit and say that they or might have be this in there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I just feel like it's it's something that people like to do here without really knowing. <laughs> There's <laughs> no way of knowing how correct the statistic is. And it might be correct for what maybe the census collected, but whether that reflects what's actually happening is unclear. Um, however, if we use this number for the moment, 31 million, that's over six times the population of Ireland or the Republic of Ireland and over 9% of the US population, which starts to speak to how popular this holiday is here. Absolutely. Let's talk about the holiday and particularly about how it took form and took shape in North America. But before we do that, it's time to take one more break. Yeah, great. Let's do our last ad break and we'll come back up and we'll, we'll put a bow on this and have maybe a green beer. <laughs> Here we go. We are back. It's the Geography is Everything podcast. We're talking about Geography is St. Patrick's Day. We've talked a bit about St. Patrick and about how this holiday emerged over centuries in Ireland. But let's talk a little bit about how it is celebrated in North America and how the holiday that we know today came to be. So St. Patrick's Day became something a bit different when when practiced by people of Irish heritage in North America. The festive and raucous holiday that many associate with St. Patrick's Day today largely grew out of celebrations in the United States, starting in the, in the 1700s and even previous to that. So generally speaking, Boston gets credit for having the first St. Patrick's Day celebration and parade in 1737. New York's was St. Patrick's Day Parade. The first one was 1762. But there's now evidence that suggests that St. Patrick's Day may have occurred first in North America in St. Augustine, Florida in 1600 with a parade the following year. That So that's very fascinating because if, if people don't know, St. Augustine, Florida is actually the oldest continuously habited European like, col like colonial city in, in the, the country, right? So it's older than Boston, it's older than Philadelphia or, you know, any of the, I, I don't know, Roanoke, whatever, you know, those old, old English colonies. So it's also, and it was Spanish. It was a Spanish colony that was right. founded, you know, as part of, you know, Spanish Florida. And it's fascinating that that, that area in particular might have been the home to the very first St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think you can track a lot of how the holiday developed from there, but if you go to St. Augustine's city website, they're going to make a big deal out of this because they're like, hey, it started here first. So New York and Boston, which you already mentioned, are places that are really well known for celebrating St. Patrick's Day today and have sizable populations of people with Irish heritage. Uh, remember that these ho this holiday is happening before the United States is a country, right? So this is these are areas that are controlled by the United Kingdom at the time. And so celebrating something like this under British rule carries a kind of a political association with it as well. This is a way of asserting an identity in the face of a group that, as you mentioned before, has been involved in colonizing this uh, other place, Ireland, for you know hundreds of years. So it's interesting to think about that these celebrations predate you know, the Declaration of Independence, for example. Right. I mean, so New York's, it says here, what, 19, 
or sorry, not 19, 1762 might have been the very first time. That's, I have to imagine during that time, there was probably a lot of simmering tensions going on between what, what was then the 13 colonies and, and you know the British Empire. And celebrating St. Patrick's Day at, with a parade was probably almost kind of seen as like a way of saying, or a, or an, an act of you know of retaliation almost against the the UK, right? Like we we're going to align ourselves more with with Ireland, who has like a long history of fighting back against you. It's it's interesting too that if you look back and you. Apparently, a lot of the first celebrations of St. Patrick's Day in New York and Boston were Irish Protestants who began celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Um, and this was, and a lot of time, these individuals were uh, were connected to power and to wealth in these cities. And these were usually done in private parties, like in you know in a, in a closed sort of atmosphere. And then some of these early parties were, you know, reputed to be pretty expensive to go to, to get a ticket to. But the tradition of these public celebrations developed a bit more with Irish Catholics. And if you recall from history, Irish Catholics were treated extremely badly when they arrived in the United States. Um, And so in some ways, this public celebration of St. Patrick's Day and having a parade was a way of pushing back against this treatment and demonstrating an ethnic pride for a group of people who were maligned for the ethnicity that they were. As the Irish became more accepted in the United States, St. Patrick's Day also became more widely celebrated by those who were not of Irish heritage. I read somewhere that there were many Irish who fought in the Civil War, and so this sort of changed the status, the general population's view towards Irish <clears throat> oh, they're fighting the Civil War. This is a patriotic thing. Um and so that 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 attitude shifts. Let's talk about some of these traditions. You've mentioned a few of them. Corn, beef, and cabbage. When I grew up, when not an Irish f- family, we would have corn, beef, and cabbage for St. Patrick's Day every year. That was the way our family celebrated. But apparently in Ireland, it was ham or Irish bacon that was served with cabbage. And the cheapest cut of meat that poor Irish immigrants could obtain in the United States was corned beef, which is beef that's salted to preserve it. And so that has become a tradition based on the reality of people and what they could get to celebrate this holiday with at the time. So that's interesting that corned beef is, this is a tradition that emerges really from the United States. And the economics of that's right. of the situation. It's, not, exactly a, it's right. not like a, a historic sort of- It's not like, let's get some corned beef because that's our favorite. That's not the way it went. It's like, right. I guess we can get this. Let's get this. Yeah. I have actually, I've never had corned beef. I thought it was beef with corn in it. And I, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I've never I, seen it. I've never <laughs> I, I think the cornness relates to the brininess uh, and the way it's mm-hmm. preserved. Apparently it was boiled several times to get some of the briny taste out of it. And then cabbage is thrown in on the third boil. Of course, there's different ways of doing this. Green beer, you mentioned. So green beer was also introduced as a way to St. Pal- Patrick's Day in New York City, apparently in 1914. So it goes back a little bit, but this is not something apparently that in Ireland they're like, let's make the green, let's make the beer green. And they, like you said, they're covered, they're surrounded by green. They don't need to do that. But in New York, they thought, well, this would be probably maybe a good way to promote things, or let's just get as much green in the mix as we can. So let's do that. Not to be outdone by Chicago. Now, so Chicago's first St. Patrick's Day parade was in 1843. And before I forget, I want to mention that the first St. Patrick's Day parade in Canada occurred in Montreal in 1824. And if, listener, you take a close look at Montreal city flag, there's a shamrock on it. So that tells you something mm-hmm. about the heritage of this city. And so the city of Chicago has dyed the Chicago River green since 1962. And it, it's a bright green. It's I've seen green. some pictures. It's not, it's not subtle. <laughs> it's not subtle. It's clearly green. Like You can tell the difference. <laughs> So in the 1950s, the Chicago Journeyman Plumbers Local Union used a green dye to identify the source of sewage leaks into the river. So this was a practical thing that was used. And then the Plumbers Union decided that this would be a great thing to do to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So they dumped 100 pounds of the dye on St. Patrick's Day, which turned the river green for a week. 
Oh my god! <laughs> and the people in that that first year must have been like, "Oh my what, god, our river is destroyed. It's it's, it's what's going clearly on toxic. Here. That's yeah, right. What's going on? I mean, I think there was some pollution at the time, which is why they were testing for it. But certainly, that must have been startling to people who didn't know what was going on. The original dye was also oil based, so this it probably couldn't have been that great. They started using mm-hmm. less of it, and now apparently they use a vegetable based dye, which is actually orange powder. The formula apparently is kept very secret, and this is put into the river. So there's two power boats that go out. One mixes the powder into the river, and one stirs it around. And it only takes a few minutes for the entire river to turn green. But this lasts a lot less than a week. It lasts part of a day. Not everybody's in favor of this. I know that some environmentalists have said this is this can't be good. We, we probably shouldn't be doing this. It um, probably it doesn't look like it's good for the river. I don't know if there's fish in that river, but. I will say I can't this. imagine that's like a benefit to them, you know? <laughs> I happened to be in Chicago one year for St. Patrick's Day. And I was there, the geography tie-in is I was there for the annual meeting of the Association of American Geographers, now the American mm-hmm. Association of Geographers. And we walked, we were walking around and it must have just happened because there were people just starting to gather and we're like, wow, that is some bright green water right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everybody, people are taking pictures with it. And later we went up to one of the tall buildings and I was able to get a picture as the day was ending. And you could still see this little green strip in the background, which was the river. So, you know, I read that it lasts for a couple hours. I think it lasts for more than a couple hours, but, mm. uh, you know, I'm not really sure. But this is a, a very famous thing. And I think a few other cities have adopted this thing. I don't know if they get the orange powder that they have in Chicago or how they do it. Um, hopefully it's not antifreeze or something like that, but you know that's that's what it looks like. Kind of, it's kind of that antifreezy color. It is, yeah. It's it's it looks toxic. It does. I would right. not want to go swimming. I probably wouldn't want to go swimming in that river. Well, and there are people but. out there on paddle boards and kayaks, and so for their <laughs> sake, I, hopefully it's okay. So let's go back to Ireland a little bit. So th- all this is happening in the United States, and we have this uh, tradition starting the 1700s, 1800s. It becomes very public. There are parades. There's a lot of public drinking, a lot of merriment. And it was only in 1903 that St. Patrick's Day became an official public holiday in Ireland. So it's not an official holiday here, as you pointed out, but it became you know, sanctioned by the state in 1903 in Ireland. And here's, here's something that's curious. Up until the 1970s, there was a law in Ireland in effect that kept businesses, almost all businesses, including pubs, closed on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't, that well, seems, the, it seems like the antithesis of what St. Patrick's Day is today. <laughs> well, I, I, that's the way most of us, many people associate it, I think. Um, so, this law changed in the 1970s and people started kind of seeing on television, hearing about the way that they were celebrating in the United States and Canada and other places. And they said, maybe we should catch this vibe a little bit. And so they started having these more North American type style celebrations for St. Patrick's day in Dublin at this time. But it was really only in the late 20th an early 21st century, and we're still in the early 21st century, that this kind of celebration was widely practiced throughout Ireland. So in the mid-1990s, the Republic of Ireland's government began to use St. Patrick's Day as a way to promote Ireland, Irish culture, and tourism to Ireland. So in 1996, the first officially sanctioned St. Patrick's Day festival was held in Dublin, organized by a government-backed group of the same name. And then subsequently, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland's joint tourism marketing body, which is called Tourism Ireland, began heavily promoting the island of the island of Ireland. So both countries or both areas, because Northern Ireland's not a country of its own, as a destination for celebrating St. Patrick's Day. And now apparently a million people travel to Dublin every year to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. But this is, again, since the 90s that this has been this sort of global level thing. I would be curious to know who has now the bigger St. Patrick's day celebration, Dublin or Boston. Apparently it's New York, New York. Okay. Well, I mean, New York's such a, it's a, it's a big place, a huge place. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And people, I mean, people like to go to Boston and Dublin, but people, you know, New York is on a lot of people's bucket lists. I think Mm -hmm. they're all fantastic cities, but apparently there's 
on order of 2 million people who are involved in coming out to witness the parade on St. Patrick's Day, which I think exceeds anywhere else. But again, this is one of those, how do you count a million people? How do you count 2 million people? But apparently New York is still the, the big the biggest party for St. Patrick's Day. Um, there are celebrations throughout the world, particularly in places, as you suggested, Jeff, uh, with people where they have many people of Irish heritage. Some of these places include Argentina, Australia, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, the UK, and the United States. The I guess this tourism board, Tourism Ireland, has also promoted something called Going Green for St. Patrick's Day, I think this started in around 2010. So this is pretty recently. And this is where landmarks across the world are lit up in green on St. Patrick's Day. And apparently the first places that participated in this were Sydney, illuminating the Opera House, and then the Sky Tower in Auckland, New Zealand. And apparently there are hundreds of landmarks globally that are now bathed in green light for St. Patrick's Day. Right, like the Empire State Building is probably green. That's probably one of them. That's right. I don't know if we do that here in Portland, but we'll just have to go pay attention in, at the end of the week. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I, w- I wonder if like Moda Center, which is like our local basketball arena, they, they, they'll change the colors occasionally for that, for different things. I wonder if that'll be green. The Morrison Bridge has lights on it that were installed during the administration of Mayor Vera Katz. And they have different colors to choose from, I think. So I'm wondering if, if that bridge hmm. in particular will be green. Clearly, St. Patrick's Day has become commercialized. I mean, that's, you know, I think there are a few companies who, who love St. Patrick's Day probably more than Guinness, for example, because you know, this is a moment where you can insist on drinking Guinness. The National Retail Federation of the United States, and we've heard from them before when we talked about Christmas mm-hmm. and Halloween, they track spending on holidays. They mostly estimate spending on holidays. And they estimate that $7.2 billion will be spent on St. Patrick's Day in 2024. I think that includes traveling and hotels and all this mm-hmm. kind of thing, p- people doing that. Uh, I don't have any information on how much of that is beer. I'm guessing more than a little. And this $7.2 billion is up from the $3.8 billion that was spent in 2007. So- the trajectory has been on the up and up. The national, yeah, I, I can't, Im- like, I don't know what, like, if I were, if someone were to ask me, like, what am I, you know, go out and buy something for St. Patrick's Day, I don't know what I would buy aside from maybe a thing of Guinness <laughs> or like, like a green hat or something, you know. Maybe maybe I, I, already have, I already kind of have that. I would, I already have green attire. So I don't know if I would buy more a green attire, maybe like a, I don't know, like maybe those like goofy glasses or something yeah. to say happy you know, St. Patrick's Day or something. <laughs> I think for the reasons you're mentioning, I'm thinking a lot of this is related to to travel and that, that those figures must be included here in some way and hosting parties and this kind of stuff. Uh, this organization or this federation estimates that 62% of Americans will in some way celebrate Pat- St. Patrick's Day. This is done by a survey of about 80 80- 8,500 people or something. So, But the margin of error they claim is 1.1%, which is Pretty solid for a margin of error. Anyways, what is that? This is up from 48% in 2007. So, you know, what, as I think you're suggesting, what constitutes celebrating St. Patrick's Day? And for 82% of the people who took this survey, it means wearing green. So that's the main. Of course. You gotta. You gotta wear green. Did you have this? And I don't know if this is still a thing. When I was in elementary school, the, the pressure was on to wear green because apparently, you would be pinched by others if yes. you were not wearing green. <laughs> yes, I, I absolutely remember pe- like kids pinching each other, which doesn't seem like something that should be allowed to today. Be. That's that would be called assault. Uh, yeah. you, know, you can't you can't do that, right? Like it was probably not really okay back then. And I think that sometimes people who are Irish back when I went to school probably may have been treated badly by people on St. Patrick's Day because, again, this is a moment of of ethnic pride that was maybe not appreciated by all people. So the wearing of green, though, has become very typical. Um, and that's the main way apparently people celebrate. For 29% of people in the United States, apparently this means preparing a special dinner at home. Maybe that's corned beef. Maybe it's something else. For an estimated 27%, which is you know, if that's the case, that's a, over a quarter of the people. That means attending a party at a bar or a restaurant. 
that's that's where a lot of that money is spent, I think. 26% means decorating their home or office. And for 15%, it means attending a parade. And there are some big parades out there, annual parades, but this is, this is one that is big in more than just one place, big in many cities across the country, uh, this country, Ireland now, and across the world as well. A couple more things. I felt like we need to broach the leprechaun situation. I was wondering when we were going to talk about it. It's the, it's such an icon. Well, I get, is it, it is, is it associated with St. Patrick's Day? I actually don't know. It is now. Actually, I, in my head. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, it right. is now. I mean, if you look at the decorations you can buy or the way that people dress up at parades and things like that, it seems like the leprechaun look is something that people are going for. And is I think, and I think in the United States, particular in particular, it's been associated with St. Patrick's Day. So leprechauns in Irish folklore are small, solitary, male, fairy, or elf-like supernatural creatures. I, my, my readings suggest that they were figured more prominently in semi-recent folklore than in the way back folklore. But these creatures are sometimes associated with playing of tricks and pranks, or even more nefariously, absconding with children, kind of Krampus like, you know, when we talked about Christmas. But on a, on a serious note, the United States and perhaps elsewhere, Irish people were sometimes graphically represented as leprechauns and political cartoons and things, which were used to perpetuate often very negative stereotypes of Irish people and people of Irish descent. So all you have to do is look at, I mean, there are probably still some political cartoons that do this, but if you look at some older political cartoons, you can see. You can see this in practice. Now, in more recent times, I think the the leprechaun is seen as a more positive thing. Um, they're often depicted as cobblers, which not like the dessert, but you know, people who make shoes. <laughs> and they have a hidden pot of gold. They have access to gold. They hide it at the end of the rainbow where you can't really get to. Apparently, if you catch one, you get the gold. Um, and up, interesting as well, is up until the 20th century, accounts of leprechaun attire emphasized red and not green clothing. So the color scheme has been thrown off a couple times here in the history and the geography of things. I, m- my guess is that in the United States, the popular imagination of leprechauns has been highly impacted by the Lucky Charms leprechaun. It, okay, I was going to say, it has to be... That I, I so I just have so many intrinsic memories of watching cartoons as a kid, and that one of those commercials coming on because they're trying to advertise to me because I want you know sweet you know marshmallow cereal. That's right. You're the right and, demographic for that. <laughs> right, the, when you're watching the Saturday right demographic. morning cartoons, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And like seeing that cartoon sort of leprechaun, yeah, leprechaun come out and sort of you know bop around and sort of you know make merriment and make you know everything fun and everybody's chasing after him and it's like oh yeah that's what a leprechaun is that's right and but instead of gold the children are seeking the lucky charms which they, they want the cereal they, they want, want the sweets the, cereal, the marshmallows so the last thing i thought i'd mention is erin gobra you've probably heard this expression before it's associated with saint patrick's day and it translates as ireland forever so that's mm-hmm. if you encounter that, that's what that means. There's always more to say about holidays. There's always more to say about everything that we cover on these episodes, but that's the time we have today. And it was a really fun episode, learning all about St. Patrick's Day and Ireland. I think broadly, maybe Ireland's one of those places that we just need to have an episode about. Maybe that can sort of catch up, catch a lot of these other things that we keep touching on Ireland for, and we can sort of bring it all together because Ireland- it has been... For such a small country, it's, it's impacted such a has had such a wide impact on the world, right? In terms of cultural and, and right. the diaspora and everything like that. So, have you been? Oh, absolutely, I've yeah. been. I love yeah. going to Ireland. Yeah. yeah, I've been to Ireland and found it to be absolutely fantastic. And there are many fantastic countries in the world, but Ireland is one of them. Let's just say. Well, with that, Hunter, let's go ahead and hit our pluggables. So I'll let you kick it off here. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm the co-author of Portland is a Cultural Atlas and Upper Left City is a Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. My co-author there is David Bannis. Jeff was a contributor to the Upper Left Cities. And I am co-host of this podcast that you're listening to right now with Jeff. Geography is everything. Thanks, Hunter. Yeah, my name is Jeff Gibson. I am co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. You can also find me over on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash 
little at sign geography by Jeff. You can watch some videos. I come out weekly. They're really fun. If you enjoyed what you watched or or listened to today, please like and subscribe to us on YouTube or uh, rate and review us on whatever podcast app you use. Those always really help with the algorithmic rankings. So, you know, always nice to see you just generally. Let's see, Hunter, next week we are, oh, this, so this, this is going to be fun. We're actually doing a kind of two-parter. It's not oh. really, they're both going to be very independent episodes, but they sort of linked in, you know, sort of a way that we've done before. And so next week, I believe we're kicking off with a Geography is Alaska episode, and that will be followed the next week with a Geography is Hawaii. And these are two very fun episodes because while they're both full states of the United States, they are also different in a lot of ways because they're not. They're sort of separate from the contiguous landmass, and each has a very interesting and sometimes tragic history with, you know, colonialism and sort of, you know, how they became part of the United States we know today. So we're going to explore both of those pretty in depth, and that should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Over the next couple of weeks, that's that's what's that's what's on tap. It's Alaska, and then it's Hawaii. That's yep. Right. So two weeks of of diving deep into two very beautiful states for two very very different. Two very different, but both very beautiful states. So it should be a lot of fun. So come back next week. We're going to start uh, with Alaska. And then the, the week after that, we'll do Hawaii.